Welcome back. Today, let's take a look at this exclusive from Politico that deals with the recent U.S. news story. Um, sure, every or many, many citizens have opinions about this topic. And, you know, I'm a citizen as well, so sure, I'm going to have an opinion. But let's try to take things in turn, try to have a civil discussion or thought process about this and see what insights we can glean from recent news. Um, so there's a draft opinion that was leaked from the Supreme Court that hasn't been published yet. This is just a draft opinion. Other drafts may follow. We wouldn't know most of the time because most of these drafts don't leak. Uh, but ultimately, judges do convene and uh, rule on cases. And the way they rule on the cases is supposed to be based on the facts of an individual case. Ordinarily, I don't know if there are cases where a judge would generally say, we are going to rule on a different case instead of the one in front of us. I'm not sure exactly how that plays into this, but let's uh, take a look at what got presented. Uh, so this draft opinion did get leaked, and it seems to indicate um, that the court is overturning a previous case. Um, so uh, yeah, Alito writes, we hold that Roe and Casey, two separate cases, Roe v. Wade and the Casey case I'm less familiar with. Uh, he writes in his initial majority draft that gets circulated inside the court, the rules that these two cases must be overruled. And so there was an image here, and we're not going to show the image, but there are uh, rights supporters and uh, anti-abortion demonstrators that have rallied outside the U.S. Supreme Court on November 1st of last year. Uh, this article is published by Josh Gerstein and Alexander Ward and has been updated and I assume will continue to be updated as new information is available. Um, so the court voted to strike down the landmark Roe v. Wade decision according to this uh, initial draft a majority opinion uh, that got circulated inside the court and somehow Politico ended up with a copy of it with some anonymous source providing it to Politico. And this raises a separate question of like, how does Politico end up being the source publishing this material? Is there any concern that they would have publishing such a thing? Well, in an ethics course, you might be taught, well, if there's somebody leaking information, they choose to leak it to you, or they could choose to leak it to other sources and so you might uh, take it upon yourself to publish what they have uh, leaked to you. So you could east, at least responsibly control or attempt to responsibly control the information that is leaked. Um, and yeah, seemingly that is what happens here. Uh, otherwise, that person could just go to other sources and continue threatening to leak the information until somebody actually accepts that information and does leak it or does publish uh, the leaked information. But yeah, so it appears that the court has voted to strike down. The, and, you know, that doesn't really make sense. You'd have to read the wording of the opinion. Generally speaking, a judge, I think, would rule on the facts of an individual case, like I said before. And yeah, this is a character analysis of the opinion that it's a repudiation of the 1973 decision which guaranteed federal constitutional protections of abortion rights and a subsequent decision, Planned here, Parenthood versus Casey, that largely maintained that right. So Alito is contending here that Roe was egregiously wrong from the start and note that this is published in a way that helps readers understand what is at stake here. It doesn't necessarily uh, indicate the way that this was written in the opinion in the draft. And perhaps we should take a look at the draft since it is provided here. Um, but yeah, he says, we, we hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. 
in the opinion of the court. It's time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to people's elected representatives. Now, that's not something you would just say on a whim. There are no doubt other considerations here. Um, goodness. So Alito delivered the opinion of the court. How many pages is this? Okay, this is uh, it's not so terrible. Um, abortion. So this is Alito delivering this opinion. I am merely reading what he has written. Uh, further, I probably won't read all of this. But he argues that abortion presents a profound moral issue on which Americans hold sharply conflicting views. Some believe fervently that a human person comes into being at conception, and that abortion ends at ends an innocent life. Other feel just as strongly that any regulation of abortion invades a woman's right to control her own body, and prevents women from achieving full equality. Still others, in a third group, think that abortion should be allowed under some, but not all, circumstances, and that within this group, uh, those within this group hold a variety of views about the particular restriction that should be imposed. For the first 185 years after the adoption of the Constitution, each state was permitted to address the issue in accordance with the views of its citizens. Then in 1973, the Supreme Court had the ruling on Roe v. Wade even though the Constitution makes no mention, and this is Alito saying this, makes no mention of abortion, the court held that it confers, it, I suppose, being the Constitution here, confers a broad right to obtain one. It did not claim that American law or that the common law had ever recognized such a right, and its survey of history ranged from the constitutionally, and here's what he's saying, irrelevant in his view, its discussion of abortion is an antiquity, to the plainly incorrect, and he explains that its assertion that uh, abortion was probably never a crime under common law. After cataloging a wealth of other information, having no bearing on the meaning of the Constitution, the opinion concluded with a numbered set of rules, much like those that might be found in a statute enacted by a legislature. Under this scheme, each trimester of pregnancy was regulated differently, but the most critical line was drawn at roughly the end of the second trimester, which at the time corresponded to the point at which a fetus was thought to re achieve viability, to survive outside the womb. Although the court had acknowledged that states had a legitimate interest in protecting potential life, it found that this interest could not justify any restriction in previous uh, could not justify any restriction on pre viability abortions. Uh, let me reprocess that. So, although the court acknowledged that states had a legitimate interest in protecting potential life, the Supreme Court found in Roe v. Wade that the interest, that the state's interest, could not justify any restriction on pre-viability abortion. Um, so, yeah, this is saying that the. Supreme Court at that time overruled states' laws and decisions on this. The court did not explain the basis for this line, and even abortion supporters have found it hard to defend Roe's reasoning. One problem, okay, and so, yeah, he argues, like, how difficult it is. At the time of Roe, 30 states still supported abortion at all stages. In the years prior to that decision, about a third of the states had liberalized their views, but Roe abruptly ended that political process. Um, it imposed the same highly restrictive regime on the entire nation. It effectively struck down the abortion laws of every single state. Uh, as Justice um, 
Byron White aptly put it in his dissent. Again, these are Alita's words, aptly represented the exercise of judicial power. <laughs> um, okay, okay, so we got these opinions. Eventually in Planned Parenthood versus Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey, the court revisited Roe, but the members of the court split three ways. Two justices expressed no desire to change Roe, Four others wanted to overrule the decision in its entirety, and the three remaining justices, who jointly signed a controlling opinion, took a third position. Their opinion um, did, I'm trying to read this, did not endorse Rowe's reasoning. They even hinted that one or more of the authors might have reservations about whether Constitution protects a right to abortion. But the opinion in Casey concluded that stare decisis, which calls for following the previous ruling of the court, uh, when Roe, and that central holding, that the state cannot uh, protect before viability, even if the holding was wrong. Anything less the court, the opinion claimed, would undermine respect for this court and for the rule of law. So let's try to unpack Casey here for a second. So yeah, we saw that two um, expressed no opinion to change a row, four expressed uh, wanting to completely override, and the remaining three and so you can see two and three make five, and so like the four did not succeed in overruling the court's previous decision at, decision at that time. Um, they did not support Roe's reasoning, but uh, did note that um, this pre-viability concept was something that the court felt was important at that time uh, in order to stay consistent with their prior ruling. Paradoxically, the judgment in Casey did a fair amount of overruling. Several important abortion decisions were overruled, I assume in toto means in totality, and Roe itself was partly overruled by Casey, throwing out the trimester formulation and substituting other ruling rules. All right, all right, so, and we could go on and on, and there are many pages even in this draft opinion. Uh, I'm skimming it now to see. Uh, before us now is one sage state law that um, brings up this contention and some nuance. I guess I can't skim this completely. Um, but they have this concept of due burden and undue burden and so forth. Americans have divergent, widely divergent opinions on abortion. Others, yeah, you know, have, yeah, sure. Before us now is one such state law. Uh, out of twenty-six states that have asked this court to override rule a row, and allow states to make their own decision. Mississippi asks to uphold the constitutionality of law that generally prohibits an abortion till the 15th week, or after the 15th week, rather. Uh, so, I mean, okay, so this opinion, we hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. Da, 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 da. So what's the rationale? The Constitution makes no reference. I'm not so sure about that. Actually, there is a Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights is in the Constitution. I have to think carefully about this. Um, so, yes, yeah, cl Alito claims that uh, there's no such right implicitly protected by a Constitution. Um, including the one on which this, etc., uh, that Roe and Casey stand. Um, so the 
principal, um, including the one on which the defenders of Roe and Casey now chiefly rely, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Provision has been held to guarantee some rights that are not maintained in the Constitution, but any such right must be deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition, and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. So, like, if every state had wildly different rules and laws, then the 14th Amendment could be argued as a clause in favor of of uh, the Roe v. Wade and uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey decisions. Um, so, uh, I mean, so he argues, Alito argues that there's no uh, constitutional right for liberty. Um, and he argues that the 14th Amendment doesn't cover it. But he doesn't argue about other amendments, as far as I can tell here. It's time to heed the Constitution, he claims, etc. Um, I mean, so that's one argument. And I'm sure many people have many arguments, not just about the 14th Amendment. And um, So, yeah, there's factors not considered in Casey, and Casey overrode the previous ruling. And analysis must begin with the language of the instrument. Constitution makes no express reference to right to obtain. Uh, Roe was remarkably loose in its interpretation of the constitutional text. And so uh, the court's dis discussion left open at least three ways in which some combination of provisions could protect this right. One possibility, the this in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people. Another possible way for this right to an abortion was in the First, Fourth, or Fifth Amendment, or some combination of these provisions. And this is what actually I was most curious about here. It was like, what about the Bill of Rights and such, right? Um, Surely there's something about uh, just being able to act on your own anatomy, but um, I don't know. But yeah, so I guess the point given by Alito is that he's not seeing a convincing demonstration in the court's previous discussion that would support the notion that the Constitution um, does actually protect a person's right to make this decision. One could also easily argue, I assume, that, well, does government have the right to make a decision that the person can't make that decision? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Um, so... Uh... Right, have incorporated into the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, just that, 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 that. And a third path was that the first, fourth, and fifth played no role, and that this right was simply a component of the liberty protected by, under the 14th Amendment with due process. Um, we discussed this theory in depth below. And the Casey court did not defend this unfocused analysis and instead grounded its decision solely on the theory that the right to obtain the abortion is part of the liberty protected under a 14th Amendment, under the Due Process Clause. Um, so they discussed this last theory in depth below, but before doing so, briefly address one additional provision uh, that has been offered. Um, so, as yet another potential home, 14th's Equal Protection Clause. Um, see this. Neither Roe nor Casey sought to invoke this theory, and so it is squarely far close to our precedent. Um, curious. Um, 
So yeah, then they turn to Casey and talk about how they, this 14th Amendment is not enough to uphold Casey. But that's different than what Alito originally contended, which was that not just Casey, but also Roe had to be overturned. And so this is going to be a difficult stance to talk about, I would imagine. Um, so yeah, they begin with common law background and, uh, I mean, I'm not so interested in whether common law supports this, uh, unless somehow the court factors that into in its analysis and says that common law therefore sets the path that we must follow here. I would imagine that certainly some of the amendments to the Constitution uh, grant this notion that a person can make a decision, but um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so the most important early American decision of Blackstone's contemporaries, oops, my mouse automatically scrolled. But yeah, this indicates um, that this is a heinous misdemeanor. So there is some support for the notion that, I mean, goodness, you'll find throughout history, this has been a contentious subject. Um, so yeah, that's understood. The original ground for drawing distinction uh, between pre- and post-quickening abortions. Not entirely clear, but some have attributed the, uh, the rule to the difficulty of proving that this uh, fetus had been alive. Okay, so again, this is super old common law context, which at some point could prove useful, but I don't think it's useful until we've exhausted everything after it first. The inescapable conclusion he concludes here is that this right is not deeply rooted in the nation's history and the nation's traditions. On the contrary, well, hmm. see, that is already a point of contention. You could argue that previous to Roe, it's not part of our history, but now it is. And that complicates things. Um, but yeah, if you're arguing that overall throughout our totality of history has it been a concern or has this right been protected? Mm. Respondents and their Amici friends have no persuasive answer to historical evidence. Uh, so yeah, friends of the court are able to submit opinions to be reviewed by the court on various subjects. Solicitor General next suggests that history supports a right because the common law's failure to criminalize abortion before quickening means that at the founding and then for decades thereafter women generally could terminate a pregnancy in its early stages. Yeah, but okay. Alito immediately counters this by saying, but um, the insistence on quickening was not used universal here. And that many states in the late 18th and early 19th century did not discriminate in such a way. And when legislatures begin to exercise the authority uh, a century more, uh, more on, no one, as far as we are aware, argued that the laws they enacted violated a fundamental right. Well, yeah, you're asking, are the people enacting laws also saying that the laws they are enacting uh, violate a human right? So, like, enactors of laws are not going to say, hey, I'm writing a law, and the law I'm writing is also, like, in violation of those things we hold closest to us. Um... Another amicus, another amicus brief relied upon the respondents uh, trying to dismiss the significance of state criminal statutes 
which were in effect when the 14th Amendment was adopted, uh, suggesting that they were enacted for illegitimate reasons. So, yeah, arguing that, um, you know, the 14th Amendment's institution where it may come into conflict with laws, uh, those laws could be illegitimate. But the Tenth Amendment would seem to argue otherwise. That, like, it's hard for the federal government to argue that states' laws are illegitimate. Instead of pressing, seriously pressing the argument that the abortion right had deep roots, supporters of Roe and Casey contend that um, abortion right is an integral part. Uh, okay. But, yeah, they talk about the heart of liberty, etc. Ordered liberty sets limits and defines the boundary between competing interests. Roe and Casey each struck a particular balance between the interests of a woman who wants an abortion and the interests of what they termed potential life. But the people of various states may value those interests differently. In some states, voters may believe that the abortion right could be even more extensive than required by Roe and Casey. Voters in other states may wish to impose right restrictions based on their belief that abortion destroys an unborn human being. Our nation's historical understanding of ordered liberty does not prevent the people's elected representatives from deciding how it should be regulated. See, um, so there was a time when, even before our nation had uh, fully matured, where we had 13 independent colonies and those 13 colonies each had their own sets of laws, and they were content being separate colonies, and then they united together to form the United States of America and fight against King George. Um, however, yeah, the one reservation that our founders had was that this federal government would make decisions that would severely... Uh, unduly burden the states and so that's why quickly thereafter the constitution was written a bill of rights had also been written and amendment 10 indicates in a way that's similar to alito's understanding that states can make their own decisions on such things and where states can make their own laws and not be ruled over by the federal government one thing, however, uh, that followed that is the 14th Amendment, which I think the combination of the 14th Amendment and some other amendments might um, prohibit states from limiting women's rights, as this could cause havoc in a way that Alito might not appreciate. Um, so, let's see. So there's all this historical distinction information. Um, so, but yeah, Alito states his interpretation is that our nation's uh, historical understanding of ordered liberty. And so that's ignoring amendments. This is just a general... Uh, our nation's totality of history, he says, he contends, does not prevent states from deciding upon how abortion rights should be regulated. I'm not certain about that, and I'm curious what dissents uh, will indicate on that subject. Um, because, well, we'll get there in a minute. Uh, what sharply distinguishes the abortion right from the rights recognized 
in Roe and Casey, something that both those decisions acknowledged um, destroys what, uh, what, let's see, abortion destroys what those decisions call potential life and what the law at issue in this case regards as the life of an unborn human being. None of the other decisions cited by Roe and cited by Casey involve the general question or moral question posed by abortion. There, in, in these cases, therefore, are in a posit. They are not supporting the right and they're even arguing against it uh, or not in support of it. Um, by arguing in the, the way that these cases argue that their arguments do not support the conclusion that has been reached today is what he's saying and undermine their own credibility in the way that the argument was performed. So, but it still falls to the court to try to like reasonably salvage that which has been done, uh, at least by the legislature, but also in the Constitution, um, and also to try to follow their own precedent to the extent that it, doing so uh, creates an ordered reality. And um, Americans who believe that abortion should be restricted to uh, press countervailing arguments about uh, modern developments. They argue that attitudes about the pregnancy of an unmarried woman have changed drastically, that federal and state laws uh, ban discrimination on the basis of pregnancy, um, that leave for pregnancy and childbirth are now guaranteed by law in many states that the costs of medical care associated with pregnancy are covered by insurance and government assistance. So, and these are folks who believe that abortion should be able to be restricted, is I think what he's meaning. Not just restricted, but able that the states can make such a restriction. They cite all these reasons that uh, pregnancy is more viable than it has been in the past. Um, both sides make important policy arguments. Supporters of Roe and Casey must show that the court has the authority to weigh those arguments and decide how abortion may be regulated. Uh, and they failed to make that showing, and all these people making arguments have failed to make such a showing, and thus we return the power to the states is this point. We have long recognized, however, that stare decisis is not uh, an inoxorable command. Um, and it's at, at its weakest when we interpret the Constitution. It has been said that it is sometimes more important an issue to be settled than it be settled correctly. Um, so but when it comes to the interpretation of the Constitution, the great charter of our liberties, which was meant to endure through a long lapse of ages, uh, we place a high value on having the matter settled right. Um, hmm, even when that requires departing from precedent. Therefore, in appropriate circumstances, we must be willing to reconsider and, if necessary, override constitutional decisions. Uh, without overriding the Constitution, is what he's saying. And he provides examples. On many other occasions, this court has overruled important constitutional decisions. Without those decisions, footnote, footnote, American constitutional law as we know it would be unrecognizable. And, okay, no justice of this court have ever argued to the court should, that never argued that the court should never overrule a constitutional decision, but 
overriding precedent is done in a serious manner. It is not a step that we should have taken lightly. Our cases have attempted to provide a framework for deciding what precedent should be overruled, and they've identified factors that should be considered when making such a decision. In this case, the five factors weigh strongly in favor of overruling Roe and Casey, the nature of their error, the quality of their reasoning, the workability of the rules they imposed on the country, their disruptive effect on other areas of the law, and the absence of concrete reliance. So taking these in turn, without having to read the rest of the document, the absence of concrete reliance, I assume, means that it's the decision was not firmly rooted in decisions by the people and by the legislature. So if the like the people and the legislature said, we all want this, do it this way, this is going to be the law, then yeah, the law can be followed and there's no challenge with the court observing the law unless it there's some conflict with a different law or the constitution. Um, another, so these are the five factors, the qual the nature of the error that occurred. I'll leave that to Alito to figure out the quality of their reasoning. Again, Alito is going to argue on the quality of the reasoning as he's already argued. He argues there are errors in that reasoning, the workability of the rules as uh, they're imposed. So I think that's an interesting point. I think people generally don't object to um, the workability of the rules as they stand right now. There are vocal people on sides of issues here that contend that we can do better. I don't know that there's necessarily a large concern with the workability of the current solution other than it's tremendously complicated, um, but it's it's a really unfortunate compromise because without that, like, yeah, the way that Alito proposes things, that had these other cases not occurred, that states would have been able to make their own rules. But that's not where we're at today. We have a different set of rules. Um, that were given by the previous court and have been around for decades. So, yeah, some states are doing what they can to cause chaos, but um, I don't know that the current rules are unworkable. Undesirable, perhaps, but I don't know unworkable. I don't know if that applies here. And the disruptive effect on other areas of the law as decided by, yeah, the, there's problems with the previous decision if it's not firmly rooted in law here. And yeah, there's a lot of concerns. The nature of the court's error. Um, okay, so this decision goes on for many, many pages. If you really want, I could do another analysis of this document at some point. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, Roe, he argues, is on a collision course with the Constitution on the day it was decided in case he perpetuated its errors, and the errors do not concern some arcane owner of the law. I don't know. You can't really say for certain what the people were thinking other than what they discussed and other than what appears in the decision, no? It's hard to know exactly what the justices were thinking other than exactly what they've said in all the places that they said things, including their in their decision. Um, yeah, this... Um, this characterization of raw judicial power I don't know. It's really difficult for one court 
to say things this way about a previous court. Um, sure, this had been dissenting and used in those terms, but... Uh, like, that's not a good faith argument. Um, unless you can... I'd have to read that dissent to really understand what is meant by that and how one could argue such things about their own colleagues and still like manage to live under the same roof with them um that's those are some very strong words um so yeah i think there will be a much deeper analysis um, by the time the final ruling is published. And maybe not. Maybe we'll find that the final ruling is quite similar to the initial draft, but I assume much more will be said. The quality of the reasoning here... See, this is probably where Alito's point is strongest, is that like he can point to there being many concerns and problems with his interpretation of the court's prior reasoning. Um, which found that the Constitution, Italy, uh, Constitution implicitly conferred a right to abortion. Um, and yeah, he says that that decision failed to ground its decision in text or in history or in precedent. So yeah, this, and then the KC plurality of the two and the three put together to make five against the four who wanted to throw out Roe v. Wade. Uh, this plurality, while reaffirming Roe's central um, holding, pointedly refrained from endorsing most of its reasoning. And, yeah, so, revised and said that there is a right. The weakness in Roe's reasoning are well known without any grounding in the constitutional text or history or precedent. Yeah, he says, he's saying that this like there still has to be some reasoning that justifies this complicated framework that got established um so after that point the state's interest in regulation for sake of women's health became compelling and accordingly a state could regulate the abortion procedure in ways that are related to maternal health. In that document is what was stated. Um, this elaborate scheme was the court's own brainchild, he says, neither party advocated the trimester framework, um, nor did either party or any amicus argue that viability should mark this point. Well, come on. You can argue what's in the record, and I guess that's what you're arguing. Um, how else? There, I mean, laws could be written many different ways, but you've previously argued about this concept of quickening and such, which arguably could be a different standard than viability. Sure, but goodness. Um... But the court made little effort to explain how these rules could be deduced from the sources. Okay, so this is the criticism I have of Alito, is that I'm saying how surely something was said in these previous decisions, and surely you can cite what was previously said, but he says there, there's just no such thing there. Roe featured a lengthy survey of history, but much of its discussion was irrelevant, and the court made no effort to explain why that history was included. And so he provides this here, talking about the previous decision. Rose's failure, uh, even to note the overwhelming consensus of state laws in effect in that time, is striking. And what it said about the common law was simply incorrect, and he doesn't discuss in further detail here, does he? Relying on this, the court uh, erroneously argued, contrary to all these other cases, 
that the common law had probably never really treated this post-quickening abortion as a crime. After surveying history, the opinion spent many um, paragraphs conducting the sort of fact-finding that might be undertaken by a legislative committee. This included a lengthy account of the uh, position of the AMA and the position of the American Public Health Association, as well as the American uh, Bar Association's House of Delegates. So finally, after all of this, the court turned to precedent, citing a broad array of cases. The court found support for a right of personal privacy, but it conflated two different meanings of the term, the right to shield information from disclosure and the right to make and implement important personal decisions without government interference. So, yeah, right to just it. I think the right to make decisions without government interference is like you. He's arguing that that's not the same thing as right uh, to disclose or not disclose things, um, or to shield information from disclosure. I would agree that far that right to shield information from disclosure really isn't the same thing as right to an abortion. Fine. Um. Remain a handful of cases leaving something to do with marriage. Uh, when the court summarized the basis of the scheme imposed on the country, it asserted that its rules were consistent with the relative weights of the perspective interests involved, the lessons, uh, examples of medical legal history, uh, the lenity, I don't know that word, of uh, the common law, and the demands of the profound problems of the present day. So, yeah, his point is that there are factors noted here, but the way that this is devised resembled legislation that could have come from a legislative body. It happened not to originate from a legislative body, and therefore Alita's arguing, well, this is Congress's concern, not the Supreme Court's concern to uphold a pre precedent that was written in such a way. What Roe did not provide was a cogent justification for the lines it drew. Why did a state have no authority to regulate the first trimester abortions for purposes of the woman's health? Court's only explanation was the mortality rate for abortion at that stage were lower. The mortality rates for childbirth. But the court could not explain why mortality rates were the only factor that could legitimately be considered. So, and as Professor Tribe, Lawrence Tribe has written, clearly the mistakes, uh, clearly this mistakes, apostrophe something, uh, definition for a syllogism. Anyway, um, lots and lots of analysis here. Viability depends on uh, the quality of available medical facilities. And he's questioning all these points in the reasoning of the original decision. Viability line, which Casey termed Rose Central Rule, makes no sense, Alito argues. Um, and is telling other countries almost uniformly issue such a line. Um, the court then asserted power to impose uh, such rules that had been written by the previous court. All in all, Rose reasoning was exceedingly weak, um, and academic commentators, including those who agreed with the decision as a policy matter, one were unsparing in their criticism. And so we can find other folks that uh, have to criticize the decision. Despite Roe's weaknesses, its reach was steadily extended in the years that followed. The court struck down laws requiring second, abortion tri abor second trimester abortions be performed solely in hospitals. 
So this, I think, well, I'm not sure. There are various justifications for those decisions. I was going to say that the 14th Amendment somehow plays into that. Uh, just the country not wanting to inspire chaos. Um, but I'm not sure on what bases further court decisions were made. Yes, there have been complaints. Okay, we get it, Alito. Fine. People complain, you know? Um, Casey visited Roe almost 20 years later. Little of Roe's reasoning was defended or preserved. So he's going through five factors here. And this point two here is talking about um, the reasoning and how the reasoning errors are made. Workability. Well, yeah, there are some complications that are quite significant with the workability of it. However, it seems to me a workable solution. People's opinions about this will uh, differ. Um, but yeah, Alito argues that there's some questions and no clear answers there. And there's many difficulties with this, but perhaps it's more workable than the alternatives, no? Um... Let's see. Effect on other areas of law. Um, Roe and Casey have led to the distortion of many important but unrelated legal doctrines, and that effect provides further support for overruling decisions. Um, members of this court repeatedly lamented that no legal rule or doctrine is safe from ad hoc nullification by the court when an occasion for its application arises in a state or in a case uh, involving state regulation of abortion. <laughs> okay, yeah, so people quip about this, but um, the court's abortion cases have diluted the strict standing for facial constitutional challenges. Uh, I don't know. This would take a much deeper analysis, I think, than what Alito offers to say definitively that there's this is broadly overreaching into many other areas of law, no? So we've cited two cases here, three cases, where um, there's a fourth case. I don't get it. That doesn't seem like a... The Supreme Court doesn't act on many cases, I assume, but... Um, yeah, maybe four is a lot for them. I don't know. Relative uh, reliance interests, rather. Um, we have to consider whether this will upend substantial reliance interests, people relying on the older law. Um... So he does an analysis of if this overruling occurs, is this going to upend uh, large sections of the populace? Um, and he's going to conclude here that there's no evidence or not enough evidence to prove that um, overruling is not going to cause an issue. Neither decisions end a debate. Uh, over this concept. Indeed, 26 states expressly ask to override Roe. This court's inability to end the debate should not have been surprising. This court cannot bring about the permanent salute resolution of a permanent resolution of a rancorous, really? Rancorous national controversy simply by dictating a settlement and telling the people to move on. Whether uh, Whatever influences the court may have on public attitudes will stem from the strength of their opinions, not an attempt to exercise power. We do not pretend to know how political process, a system, or society will respond to today's decision. All we can only do our job, which is to interpret the law etc. We therefore hold that the Constitution does not confer the right to abortion. The Rome Casey must be overruled, and the authority to regulate abortion must be returned to the people and their elected representatives. This is conclusion here. 
we must now decide what standard will govern if state abortion regulations undergo constitutional challenge and whether the law before us satisfies the appropriate um, standing or standard. Um, what standard will govern if state... Wait, why is this necessary right now? You just got through saying that we are not going to pretend to un understand how things are going to, f or forecast how things will go in the future. And now the next point is, well, how will things go in the future? Well, in the event that constitutional challenges occur. Um, when somebody says that state law does violate the Constitution, how should the court think about this constructively? Um, as there are precedents, rational basis review is the appropriate standard for such a challenge. As explained, procuring an abortion is not a fundamental right. It follows, therefore, that states may re regulate for legitimate interests or reasons, and that when such regulations are challenged under a constitution, courts cannot substitute... Oh, come on. Okay. A law regulating this, like other health and welfare laws, is entitled to a strong presumption of validity. Hmm. Legitimate interests justify Mississippi's Constitutional Age Act, except in an emergency or in the case of a severe fetal abnormality a statute prohibits abortion if the probable gestational age of the unborn human has been determined to be greater than 15 weeks we in this opinion where we began presents a profound moral question the constitution does not prohibit the citizens from each of each state from regulating or prohibiting abortion. Um, as noted in Roe and noted in Casey, we now overrule those decisions. Or, I'm sorry, that, yeah. Um, we now overrule the two prior court decisions and return that authority back to the people and their elected representatives. The judgment in the Fifth Circuit reversed and uh, the case is remanded for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. So, and then there's an appendix interesting. So this is where you'd actually find these other cases of interest. Um, so back to the article here. Um, that was a long ruling. Let's get through the remainder of this article and then perhaps on to my further thoughts. Deliberations on controversial cases have in the past been fluid Justices can sometimes do change their votes as draft opinions circulate, and major decisions can be subject to multiple drafts and even to vote trading, sometimes until just days before a decision is unveiled. The court's holding will not be final until it is published, likely in the next two months. The immediate impact of the ruling, as drafted in February, would be to end a half-century guarantee and to allow each state to decide whether to restrict or to ban abortion. It's unclear if there have been subsequent changes to the draft. No draft in modern history of the court has been disclosed publicly while the case is still pending. This is unprecedented and already a controversial case. Draft opinion offers an extraordinary window into the justice deliberations in one of the most consequential cases before the court in the last five decades. Let's see. This is a 49-year-old precedent. The draft follows that uh, shows that the court is looking to reject Roe's logic and Roe's legal protections. Um, so this is Alito, according to this draft that got leaked. A person familiar with the court's deliberations said that none of the other four said that four of the other Republican-appointed justices um, had voted in the conference held among justices in December 
and that lineup remains unchanged as of this week. Three Democratic appointed justices are working on one or more dissents, and how uh, Chief Justice Roberts will ultimately vote, and whether he's already uh, he's joining the already written opinion or drafting his own opinion is unclear. Um, the document labeled as first draft includes a notation that's circulated among the justices on February 10th. If the draft is adopted, it would rule in favor of Mississippi in this case. Um, Roberts conf confirmed the authenticity of the draft opinion and said he is ordering an investigation into this disclosure. Let's see. To the extent this betrayal of the confidence of the court is intended to undermine the integrity of operations, it will not succeed. The work of the court will not be affected in any way. Okay, so I've read through some paragraphs here. I should offer deeper thoughts. Uh, so yeah, people tend to talk about whether a justice is appointed by a Republican president in a Republican Congress or appointed by a Democratic president in a Democratic Congress. So, and they tend to believe that these justices vote along the traditional values of the parties that appointed them. Even though, um, I don't know, it's said that justices ought to be impartial. But uh, people predict uh, the direction in which justices are expected to vote. Um, so, yeah, it's no surprise to people who which justices were import, uh, were appointed under which uh, president and under which Congress. Sure, we get that. And this clarifies what I was... Uh, well, I was going into the deeper analysis of the paper above, but yeah, in terms of practical opinion on this particular case, um, that this would rule in favor of Mississippi, and Mississippi could be able to... Um, have laws that prevent people from doing things. Um, Politico received this copy uh, from a person familiar with the court's proceedings in the Mississippi case, along with other details supporting authenticity of the document. And this is the draft, and we looked at it, including the 31 page appendix, which I skipped over. Um, yeah, documents replete with citations to previous course decisions, books, and other authorities. This is a complementary way of putting it. Yes, there are many citations to decisions, books, and authorities. Sure. One could contend about the quality and nature and so forth, and we'll see other opinions formulate that are also well supported. It's maybe not a simple issue. And I am curious how the court will eventually settle on this. The disclosure of the draft majority opinion, which is a rare breach of secrecy and tradition, uh, comes as all sides are uh, anxious and wanting this ruling. Uh, so speculation has been intense since December. Some months have passed, really. Um, and yeah. Uh, the oral arguments seem to indicate that a majority was inclined to support the Mississippi law. It'd be interesting. It's unfortunate that this article doesn't actually link to the oral argument. I suspect the reason it doesn't is because that oral argument doesn't link back to like social sites or doesn't link back to Politico and such. So there's not a tremendous motivation for this to link directly to that oral argument. Maybe a link of that isn't available, but I would assume soon enough the court would publish in some way uh, that oral argument. Um, people certainly could have heard it live, I would hope, but I would assume that a record of the argument, it's in the interests of many, many people that that oral argument be disclosed in a highly visible way. Um, yeah, under long-standing court procedures, um, justices hold preliminary votes and then do some drafts and they're capable of changing their votes and uh, redrafting and 
deciding or negotiating as stated way above. Their chief justice typically assigns majority opinions or when he is in the majority. When he is not in the majority, the decision about how to assign the decision to who's going to write it uh, is typically made by the most senior justice within the majority. Again, that's typically how this is done. It's not just the justice writing everything by themselves. They could have assistants working with them. It's largely secret how that is done. But um, yeah, there's a tradition of secrecy there. A George W. Bush appointee, you know, in 2006, Alito argues 1973 abortion rights ruling was ill-conceived and deeply flawed. Okay, so this is what I had read earlier in reading that document. Um, the overturning of Roe would almost immediately lead to stricter limits on abortion uh, rights in South in the South and the, in the Midwest, with half of those states said to immediately impose broad abortion bans. Any state could still legally allow the procedure. So this is a bit concerning, right? This is where I thought the 14th Amendment, combined with other amendments, would provide some sort of basis for not completely discarding precedent here. In discarding precedent, states are capable of um, imposing laws until those laws are proven unconstitutional. So, yeah, this, there's some chaos that gets injected by overturning a law. Or, it's not even a law in this case, it's an interpretation of law. Um, but, yeah, the Constitution does not prohibit citizens from regulating, yeah, as we noted in this the draft contains the type of caustic rhetorical flourishes Alito is known for and that has caused Roberts, his fellow Bush appointee, some discomfort in the past. Understandably so. <laughs> uh, at times, the draft opinion takes a mocking tone. Yeah. yeah. Alito declares that one of the central tenets of Roe, the viability distinction, uh, between fetuses not capable of living outside the womb, those which can, and according to Alito, makes no sense. So it's difficult to garner support while you also write in this mocking tone. I get the sense that even though perhaps this had been tasked to Alito to do the first draft, get the sense that somebody else is going to have to write this for him if he doesn't have the maturity to, like... Anyway, we don't need to go there. Uh, in several passages, uh, he describes doctors and nurses who terminate the pregnancies as abortionists. And when Roberts voted in, uh, voted with liberal jurists in 2020 to block a Louisiana law, uh, imposing heavier regulations on abortion clinics, his solo concurrence used the more neutral term abortion providers. Um, yeah. Alito's use of the phrase egregiously wrong to describe Roe echoes language. <sighs> Come on. Okay, so we're picking apart the language in the decision. Let's, let's see, the legacy of Plessy v. Ferguson, yeah, Brown v. Board of Education, egregiously wrong, etc. cetera. Uh, main opinion of the 1992 Casey decision, Justices Sandra Day O'Connor, Anthony Kennedy, and Davis Souter warned that uh, the court would pay a terrible price for overruling Roe, despite criticism of the decision from some of the public and the legal community. While it has engendered disapproval, it has not been unworkable, three justices wrote then. An entire generation has come of age to assume Roe's concept of liberty in defining the captivity of women to act in society and to make reproductive decisions. No erosion of principle going to liberty or personal autonomy 
has left Rose Central Holding a doctrinal remnant. And you recall in the document we read above, there are five uh, points on which the court has to consider when uh, overruling uh, precedent. And one of those five points, and I guess it falls to the court to figure out how they weigh all these five points, but one of those is whether the status quo is workable. So, yeah, the three justices wrote in the 90s case here that um, the status quo is workable. When Dobbs argued in December, Roberts seemed out of sync with other conservative justices. Um, an argument last fall, Roberts seemed to be searching for a way to uphold this 15-week ban without completely abandoning Roe. Um, viability, it seems to me, doesn't have anything to do with choice, but really, if it's really about choice, why isn't 15 weeks enough time? Yes, during argument, the thing that is an issue before it's today is 15 weeks. So, yeah, Roberts, yeah, this, that was argued during oral argument back in December in the most recent case. I think, hmm, I guess I'll reserve comment about Roberts until I see his complete opinion about this, but it seems more focused on the immediate case. Um, so, portions of this opinion, opinion seemed intended to address specific interests of other justices. One passage argues that social attitudes toward out-of-wedlock pregnancies have changed drastically, and that increased demand for adoption makes abortion less necessary. Uh, like, why would you go there? That seems perhaps beyond the scope of the immediate decision, but fine. These points dovetail with issues that Barrett um, raised at December. She suggested laws allowing people to surrender in a no-questions-asked basis. It meant you'd still have to carry a pregnancy to term. Um... Uh, which doesn't oblige one to engage uh, beyond carrying to term. And Barrett asked, why don't the safe haven laws take care of this problem? Um, Conservative Justice Alito um, uh, attached his draft a 31-page appendix listing laws passed to criminalize uh, during that period. Uh, claims an unbroken tradition of prohibiting uh, on pain of capital punishment from a common law until 1973. And so, yeah, the he's arguing that there's a Tenth Amendment interest that the people and their legislatures need the ability to make such a decision. And that from common law until 1973, when that Roe v. Wade occurred, that there has been this history and interest and in people have exercised this. He, he, um, now, one thing that might factor into said analysis is, um, wasn't, I'm trying to recall which amendment it is, but the Equal Protection Clause and the notion that, like, you know, women have not been traditionally empowered as much as they are today. Um, so perhaps there, there could be some failings in common law until enactment of the Equal Protection Clause. Um, and even immediately thereafter and after that and so forth until we've actually reached a point at which um, we have fair representation, you know, there could be considerable problems with just looking at the law as it's written when there's not equal representation in those uh, who choose what the laws are. Um, but until the latter part of the 20th century, there's no support in American law for this right. Um, 
And that's what Alito had added in that document. Um, so, yeah, these things that are protected by the Constitution but not explicitly mentioned, so-called unenumerated rights, must be strongly rooted in U.S. history and U.S. tradition. And this is where I think um, opinions may differ. This is why the judges have to debate things at such length. I think if you delve deep enough in history, sure, you will find many laws talking about pain of criminal punishment, but it falls to, I don't know, if there were enough time for all the amicus curiae, the friends of the court, to submit all their opinions and try to support, like, what tradition are we talking about? Is there a tradition that um, supports such a right? Um, you know, what kind of analysis could be done in an era where there are laws prohibiting abortion on pain of criminal punishment? Sure, there are such laws. And so, yeah, it's not a universal sort of thing. Like, previous to federal government getting involved here, you would find cases where states would, and even before that in common law, where it was problematic. You could not just choose to get an abortion. Yeah, I'm doing a thing. <laughs> Uh, it feels like I'm a couple hours into this analysis here, just trying to read this article from Politico and the decision therein. So, yeah, um, we are deep into this. Um, I just find this curious that this draft got leaked, but also I'm curious, um, this is such a contentious issue. And I'll get to the end of the article and maybe weigh in a bit more about uh, some more thoughts I might have. But yeah, so in various states and other history, um, you'll find like, yeah, people have enacted laws that made abortion illegal on pain of criminal punishment up to uh, Roe v. Wade, where the uh, Supreme Court made a decision. And so Alito's arguing that there's not a history and a tradition that argues in favor of a universal, unenumerated right here for a right to abortion. Um, and uh, so I guess Politico here is uh, the authors of this article I mentioned at the beginning of this, says this form of analysis seems at odds with several recent court decisions, uh, including many of its rulings backing a concept of gay rights. Uh, liberal justices seem likely to take issue with Alito's assertion in the draft that overturning Roe would not jeopardize other rights, um, such as the right to contraception, to engage in private uh, consensual activity, and for same-sex marriage. Um, and let's see. Alito writes, we emphasize that our decision concerns the specific constitutional right to abortion, not to other rights, says Alito. And so he's saying, don't conflate that with this. Um, and his draft opinion rejects the notion that the abort uh, abortion bans reflect subjugation. And, you know, this, I think we're going to see much more in draft opinions on both sides, talking about this in much more detail. This is kind of what I hinted at a minute ago, is that um, women haven't always been equal in political power, but now certainly they do have political power these days. Um, but, you know, that's a relatively contemporary thing. I don't know that we can reach all the conclusions that Alito reaches, and we can reach that all so quickly here. Uh, so the court remains one of Washington's most secretive institutions. Um, yeah, so at the Supreme Court, those who don't know, don't talk, and those who talk, don't know. 
Ginsburg's joked. Uh, let's see. Let's see. So this tight-lipped reputation has somewhat eroded in recent decades due to a series of books by law clerks, law professors, and investigative journalists writing about history, not about contemporary issues, um, and some of whom had access to draft opinions. But the books emerged well after cases had been resolved. So yeah, this kind of leak is unprecedented. Uh, justices held their final arguments of the current term on Wednesday. Court has set a series of sessions over the next two months to release rulings in unresolved cases, including this case. All right, so that's a ton to unpack here. I've tried to pepper my thoughts throughout this. Um, yeah, I think that uh, workability is one of the five points that were are uh, that are need to be considered in whether or not the court can overrule its precedent. Um, the first couple points had to do with like the nature and quality of the errors that were made previously by the court. Uh, yeah, what was that about gay marriage? <laughs> um, there's an, a point here. This is some speculation by Politico. They seem likely to take issue with this assertion that Alito made an assertion in this that this decision's about abortion. It's not about other subjects, and it's not eroding this case. It's not going to erode other rights that have come since. There's a ton of language in Roe, and there's a ton of language in Casey. And he's arguing, well, Casey overturned Roe anyway in the way it considered the reasoning in Roe. And he's arguing that, like, overturning the language and the reasoning involved in these other cases is not going to erode all these other things, is what Alito's saying here. He's, and Politico is speculating that, well, liberal justices aren't going to agree with Alito's assertion here. <laughs> They're going to probably can take some contention with that and argue, well, the court used similar rationale in this case, in that case, in this case, in that case, and like other cases might be weakened because of the court saying it's willing to reverse course um, on account of the considerations in this particular case. So what were those five points that needed to be considered by the court? The nature of the error that was made if there was an error in a previous case, the quality of the reasoning that was offered in the previous cases, the workability of the status quo, and then there were two other factors that had to be considered. Is prohibition coming back to? Good question. Now, <laughs> um, you know, that would be pretty wild, wouldn't it? Um, that you know, there, you know how prohibition came about. It was the result of um, an amendment to the Constitution. And then there came along another amendment striking the prohibition amendment. So that's our country's history with uh, alcohol. Um, I don't think that uh, the court is going to strike the striking of prohibition to bring back prohibition. Because uh, that seems pretty clear in the language of our constitution and amendments that like, like the court has no basis whatsoever to get into that. Um, I guess more interestingly, well, we don't need to go there, <laughs> but I was going to argue, well, okay, states get their uh, federal highway repair funds based on their voluntarily enacting um, regulations about the, the age at which people are allowed to drive uh, and allowed to drink rather so that's the way that um, there's a drinking age in our country and it's voluntarily imposed by states 
so that they could be eligible to receive highway repair funds. Even though there's not like a, I'm not aware of a national drinking age rule. Um, but yeah, there were five considerations given above here. One of those was the previous ruling workable. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to scan this so easily. Okay, so I could have zoomed in on this in the first place. I don't know if I'll be able to get back to the Politico article. Um, so I'm searching for the word workability here. Um, so the five factors weigh strongly in favor of overruling Rowan Casey is Alito's argument. So the quality of the reasoning, the workability of the rules that have been imposed by the decision, their disruptive effect on other areas of the law, and that's what Politico is talking about there, is that, well, if you take away Roe and Casey decisions, what other decisions are going to be affected by taking those away? And Alito argues there's not really any case to make that this would be taken away from other rights and other decisions. And uh, Politico thinks that liberal justices aren't just going to say, okay, yeah, you're right, Alito. They're, they're, that liberal justices might contend with that. It'd be interesting to see what everybody writes at that time. Oh, yeah, and the fifth point, absence of concrete reliance. So if a court made a decision and there's something they can concretely rely upon, even a law or something from the legislature or from the people that like concretely supports the decision then that um would uh, make it harder to overturn a previous decision now so alito gives many examples about our country's history some of which um you know point out that there's a point at which um and unfortunately like not all of our laws have been perfectly consistent over the centuries but there have been points at which uh, uh laws have argued at some point uh, abortion is not uh legal um so you know, there have been such... Okay, see, this is what I was afraid of, is that I've not been able to get back to the article. Sorry about that. Okay, hey, I've got back. Very good. So, yeah. Um, so those were the five points to consider there. It's clear, like, people are going to have opinions about this. Um... And we'll see all people, the judges and chief justice, um, or justices and chief justice together will all have their own opinions. And many, many other people have many opinions as well. Um, I find the language that Alito uses startling. Um, I find that like this conclusion we hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. This is Alito's language. This... Hmm. This sentence is too short. You know, when you're arguing that these massive decisions that have been... Uh, that have taken place need to be overruled, you need to contend why in the current case is it absolutely necessary? Why does the current case require overruling these preceding cases? It's not just a matter of, uh, well, those, so those five factors argue about like reasons you might overturn a decision and workability is one of those factors and perhaps workability could be considered in much more detail not just um in some general way but how does it apply to the current case because that would seem to be important here um 
Yeah, they are lifetime appointments. <laughs> they have their whole lives to make sweeping changes. Give it a few years. Yeah. Yeah. I will certainly sound off opinions in the future. Um, I will have to actually read more. I hope that uh, oral arguments made in December are readily available to the public. Sometimes courts make their opinions more easily uh, accessed than others. i would not kept on top of this for factors unrelated to politics. Um, um, yeah, I do want to learn more about how it was argued by various justices at oral argument in December. Because there are things I could say about said justices, and maybe I could learn some things too from such reading. Or understanding. <laughs> you know, so for as much attention as this case gets, um, because yeah, it overturns two uh, very large historical precedents, which Alito is arguing those two precedents weren't consistent with each other anyway, but it overturns a long-held understanding for 49 years about this um, right for an abortion. Um, and yeah, it's, for all the attention this gets, I am curious a hundred years from now how things will have settled. And that it's regardless of whether this ends up being the majority opinion or if the majority somehow manages to salvage uh, precedent and manages to preserve a woman's right to choose. Um, there are many circles inside um, civil society where decisions are made and so uh, how do I say this? So what is legal within a government might be considered immoral under um, some sort of like church nation thing. That there will be strife between government and uh, religion. And uh, there you'll find many opinions about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing for a government to perfectly align with churches. Um, so, let's see. <laughs> You're about to abandon this timeline and send a warning message to the Founding Fathers. I see. So, well... As it stands right now, there are 26 states that are looking to impose, uh, or that would want Roe v. Wade overturned, presumably because they are looking to impose restrictions on um, abortion. And I think this, in the short term, would cause chaos, much more so than some attempt to salvage uh, the existing law or not even law, but uh, court precedent. Um, I'm also curious if, even though two cases in Alito's vision, and I've been struggling with this myself, understanding how these two previous cases are somehow protected by the Constitution, even though clearly, like, this compromise seems to have been I don't see how you could have done it better than previous courts did this, but also it doesn't seem to follow a literal, I want to understand a better argument that's based in our constitution, in our history, in all these things. I want to find some way that the woman can have the right to choose here, because it seems like in hundreds of years of U.S. history and many years before that, you would think that women would have rights. And the, uh, the opposing argument 
given uh, in such cases is, well, this unborn uh, fetus also has a right, is the opposing argument. And it's a difficult thing. It's been argued so many times. Um, but we haven't seen in our writing um, anything that... I don't know anything in our Constitution or in our U.S. law that gives a right to uh, the unborn as much as um sure many times on sunday i would hear that it how important it is to petition your senator and your congressman and this sort of thing and let them know about this right to life i don't know that it's been codified anywhere just yet um so yeah again this uh there's a breakdown where what's legal under a government uh, where the government might not prevent you from doing such a thing. Churches and their communities, while they don't have the force of law, may still be able to make your life hell somehow for doing things that are immoral. Um, and government will step in and try to protect in some cases because uh, things that are protected in our constitution will try to prevent abuse in such cases um but yeah so churches and their communities might be able uh to uh make it i don't know somehow challenge people that uh, think they have this legal right, but in some moral sense might not have that same right. I don't know. So I don't know if government, um, for all the uh, attention this sort of thing gets, I don't know how much the government's decisions at a federal level and even at a state level will matter. And since people tend to also, like, have to get along with their families and friends and church groups and such, I don't know if some churches will be polarized on one side and other churches will be polarized on the other side about a woman's right to decide versus uh, unborn's right to life. I don't know that there are churches that heavily advocate for a woman's right to make decisions. Um, I'm not educated enough, I suppose. Um, yeah, so the way Alito writes is seeming to suggest, well, you know, these things are inconvenient, these previous decisions. And that in an ideal world, you know, we don't need those two decisions and things can work themselves out. Is how Alito seems to be arguing this and that the people have interests in arguing as they do. Um, so this is the point that Alito is making, is that our federal government isn't equipped right now to make such decisions. But he's also not just arguing that the federal government is not in a great place to make these decisions, but he's arguing that um, the Constitution and our U.S. law do not support these previous decisions. And so we're going to hear many, many opinions um, once the justices let us know what all their opinions are and what their ruling is. We're going to hear many opinions from everyone at that time, but uh, I'm sure there will be tons of political commentary in the interim as well. So... Uh, I, probably there are some loose ends that I haven't touched on here. I don't recall everything that I wanted to say here. Um, if it had to fall to me to be a Supreme Court Justice, what might I rule on this? I guess I've been teasing at that throughout this and sort of uh, lending my own thoughts. Um, so... 
I would need to learn more, I think. But naively at this stage, uh, I would think two things. One, that the status quo seems as controversial as it is. Um, it seems hard to design something better. Um, but two, yeah, in an ideal world, like, I don't understand how a federal government um, can uh, regulate this without substantial debate in Congress and in all the states. And without knowing what all the people want, it's difficult for a court to make uh, decisions. So, yeah, I am curious um, in the short term and the long term, like, what's going to happen here. Uh, there's going to be many people protesting no matter how this court rules, but the further it deviates from precedent and threatens to deviate in the future, then the further people will protest this and other decisions. Um, so I think people living during the fall of the Roman Empire felt like we do now. I think there is an interesting interview. I don't recall uh, the in, the interviewed guest's name. There is an expert in uh, Roman history that have been invited to uh, have been invited to the Colbert Report, and uh, he had written a book, I believe, entitled "Are We Rome." And uh, Stephen Colbert posed the question to him, well, are we Rome? Like, what similarities does our modern society have to uh, them? And quite a few similarities were found at that time. Um, so are we currently following the fall and demise of the Roman Empire? Maybe. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, yeah, there's lots of political concerns lately uh, that just seem immensely problematic. Um, so, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if that were the case. But, um, you know, America's had a good run so far. So there's some hope that maybe our current generation or next generation might be able to instill some sanity into things. Hopefully. Um, we'll have to see, though. Either way, uh, yeah, this has been uh, thanks to Josh Gerstein and Alexander Ward for summarizing this case for us. Um, I guess thanks to whoever leaked this opinion for making our days more interesting until um, the totality of the final opinion is released. And uh, yeah, hope for the best no matter what happens here. But, um, yeah, I don't know that I can say more at this time. Certainly we can read much more. So there's this 31-page appendix of how uh, various states have ruled over the years on this subject. Then, yeah, many other citations to other sources Alito gives. Um, and, <laughs> you know, one would think that... Uh, just imagine, so there must be so many clerks assisting Alito with writing this. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is indicated as the first draft here. Um, there must be so many clerks associated with the production of this document that one could consider what were for what reason did this get leaked? <laughs> And is the leak political in nature, or is it because, like, these interns have been working extremely hard producing this document and just are completely exhausted? And I don't know. I mean, this is a 98-page document replete with references. I'm sure it was carefully worded and reviewed and such, even though this is just a first draft. But, yeah, I wonder... You know, I know Roberts is in conducting an investigation to try to find how this got leaked. Assuming they figure out how this got leaked, you know, this has my curiosity. 
idly so. And maybe decades hence, we'll see a book with somebody explaining exactly what happened today. Um, yeah, because I don't know how things get to such a stage. It's not happened before and probably won't happen again for a long time. But maybe this might... I know our courts had this tradition of having secrecy until final opinions released. Maybe there could be a case for government, for the Supreme Court, um, having oral argument, going into chambers, doing extensive research, coming back and having a second oral argument for complex issues. Perhaps there could be a case for that, even though traditionally it would be a legislature that operates in such a fashion. I do wonder, because these uh, decisions are always extremely detailed, but I guess maybe it's fine the way it is. Um, it's really the role of the legislature for the people to make their voice heard, and these justices can go off and do their own thing. And I, Yeah, this is consistently done with how governments around the world operate that have this three branch system um they do likewise have judges that go off make their decision and come back without hearing the voice of the people so um yeah i think regardless what happens in this multiple things could happen um both in terms of what churches can do in terms of what local like state governments can do and also in terms of like what our congress is going to argue after this is published whatever ends up being the final article so yeah there's much still to be debated um and yeah it'll be interesting to see which way this goes even though i've kind of like made my opinion known um perhaps there's still hope somehow. So, hope we've enjoyed this analysis here, and even if it's not what people had hoped for. And, yeah, hopefully you know, we can look forward to a brighter future someday. We'll see.